Uh, I think we'll go on to our next uh, speaker who's actually been with us uh, before uh, when we uh, broached the topic of uh, intimate partner violence in which she is a real uh, world uh, renowned uh, expert. So I'm talking about Dr. Eve Valera, who is an associate professor in psychiatry at Harvard. And um, she's been involved in this field for about 25 years. And four or five years ago, she was our guest speaker and gave a wonderful talk um, about the problem. And since then, she's continued her research and it's just terrific that we've been able to invite her back and have her bring us up to speed about this most unfortunate aspect of uh, concussion. So thank you, Eve. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Tater, Tater. And I wanna thank you and the Canadian Concussion Center so very, very much for inviting me back. This is my passion and it's something that is incredibly underappreciated by so many groups and people and typically folks who tend to focus on sports related concussion don't think about this. And so um, I'm very honored and, and happy to, have, to, to be here. So I'm gonna share my screen and then I will get going. Okay, so I think everyone should be able to see that okay, is that right? Looks good. Okay, so so the first thing, oops, it's, it's moving on its own. The first thing I just wanna say is that this is, when, when, when folks think about concussion, they often think about, I don't know why this is doing this, but hopefully we'll just be for that first slide. When folks think about concussion, they often think about sports and accidents. And what I'm talking about is, um, I don't, my slides keep moving forward for some reason, and this has never happened before, so I don't know why. This could be challenging. Um, but let me let me do some let me do something. Let me just see if I can stop. It. And I don't know, maybe it's because I had that or something. But let's just uh, start it over again because that could be a little annoying, right? It's it's, it's on it. Maybe because it's on animations. Yeah, well, I, I'm going to change that now. So hopefully we'll get this right. Yeah. So sorry. And we did check this. It was working just fine before. So at any rate, most people think of uh, concussions. It's still going. Uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll speak fast enough. We'll try it because I don't want to waste any more time. But people think of sp sports, um, concussions, and they think of sports. And what I'm going to talk about is concussions or traumatic brain injuries and it's not an accident, it's from partner violence. And so this is a hard topic to talk about and it's not easy for people to listen to it sometime, but I think it's incredibly important. And I really want people to engage in this topic more and more because it is very important. And it affects probably all of us in ways that we don't even recognize. So basically I'm talking about concussion and intimate partner violence. And IPV or intimate partner violence, simply put, is violence perpetrated by a current or former spouse, partner, significant other, boyfriend or girlfriend. Now, some really unbelievable facts that I just find astonishingly horrible is that IPV is a leading cause of homicide for women globally. It's also the most common form of violence against women. So if you just let that sit for one minute, if you think about that, women, you know, who we, the people that we are with who are in this, my slides keep going, I'm sorry. The people that we are with and our partners with who are, who we like to trust and love are the ones most likely to either murder us or injure us, commit violence against us. And I will tell you in the United States, it's an average of three or four women a day who are murdered by their intimate partners. So this is not trivial. It's also the case that IPV is found across all socioeconomic boundaries. So if somebody thinks, well, yeah, that's horrible, but it doesn't happen here. In our rich neighborhood, this doesn't happen, or it only happens to Latinas or maybe people of color or Native Americans. Well, there are people who are disproportionately affected for sure, but I will tell you it happens across every type of woman, no matter what gender, no matter what culture, et cetera. It happens all over the world. The, the, the rates vary somewhat, 
but it is incredibly common. And so what are the numbers? Well, globally, one in three women have been shown to experience physical or sexual partner violence for good epidemiological studies. In some, in some countries, the number's higher, in some countries, they're lower. But the bottom line is that in one in three women, on average, are experiencing partner violence. So, so in the United States, it's between one in three and one in four, depending on who you talk to or which, which data set you're using. But think about this. So one in three, okay, so we, many of us may think, well, I'm going to tell you right now, I know, I know I'm talking to people who have experienced partner violence and, and, you know, and I'm going to be talking about brain injuries and, and this may affect you in a certain way that you didn't realize it. And I'm certainly happy to talk, talk to you afterwards, if you would like, but, but the bottom line is I know that people are about there because there's 109 people on this. And I know there's at least, you know, nine or 10 women, probably a lot more. And so I know there's people who've experienced partner violence, but I think a lot of people think they don't know anybody because it's very stigmatizing and people don't necessarily want to talk about it. But if you think about the people in your social network or the people in your work network, whatever, you probably know at least nine women. I want you to think of not just one, not two, but three of those women at least have experienced sexual or physical partner violence. By the odds, that is the reality. And why am I saying this? Am I trying to scare people into saying, oh, everyone's experiencing partner violence, it's happening everywhere? Well, no, not necessarily, it is, it's, it's happening a lot. But the reason I say this the way I do is because I want people to understand that this is not an us versus them situation. This is us. We all know people who've experienced partner violence. These are our daughters, our sisters, our mothers, our colleagues, our partners, our friends. And the reason I want to, emphasize this is because when we feel like we know somebody who has this sort of issue of whatever it is we're talking about, then we can be more engaged. And I want people to be engaged. I want people to be angry over the fact that not more is done about this and that we don't know more about what's going on with respect to brain injuries in women who are experiencing partner violence. So in partner violence, 80 to 90% of violent abuse to women injures the head or neck. I've had people tell me they've been stomped on the head with work boots, punched in the head repeatedly with fists, struck in the head with hammers and whacked in the head with baseball bats. I can go on. I am not being sensationalistic. I did not just pick the worst things that have ever, people have told me. I could tell you many more things. And remember, three to four women a day are murdered by their partners. Women are also strangled into unconsciousness at, with a regular fre frequency. So when we think about this, when we think about partner violence, the thing that seems logical is that, well, maybe there's brain injuries, acquired brain injuries, or traumatic brain injuries, but for some reason that really hasn't picked up. People have not really recognized that the way they do in sports. So what I'm going to start with is, if my slides can cooperate, a, definite, a couple of definitions of a traumatic brain injury and strangulation, because I think it's important to understand both of these to get a better sense of what's going on in, the, in, in, in women who have experienced partner violence who, or who are experiencing partner violence. And so for this group, I'll just share my definition of brain injury, which is, you know, they, they vary a little bit, but in general, a traumatic brain injury simply involves an external force to the head and disrupted brain function. So what does that mean? Oops, sorry, sorry about that, but the wrong way. Now my slides are going the opposite direction. So in short, a hit, a jolt or external force to the head that results in any loss of consciousness. So even if it's for a second, that's a brain injury. It might be considered a mild brain, brain injury, but it's a brain injury. If you have a hit or jolt or force to the head that results in any loss of memory surrounding those events, that could be considered a brain injury or any alteration in mental state at the time of the incident of that hit, jolt, or external force. So feeling really dazed, disoriented, or confused. And then also some may consider a visual disturbance or focal neurological deficit at the time of that hit or jolt to be indicative of a brain injury as well. And the bottom line is, so you can see here, I got this definition for the Mild Traumatic Brain Injury um, Committee on, from the ACRM in 1993. And there are varying definitions. And there's gonna be another definition, I think that's gonna be coming out at the end of the year from colleagues that I've spoken to. But the bottom line is, is it's not very hard to sustain a brain injury. And when we hear these stories about concussions and brain injuries, it's not like you had to be run over by a steamroller to get this, or you had to be on a football field to get it. You can get it pretty easily. On the mild end of the spectrum, there's a mild TBI, and that's just another term for concussion. Okay, and so that's one of the things that I'm gonna be talking about. The women that I'm talking about here and the brain injuries that we're talking about here are mostly mild, but some of them are moderate to severe. I'm also gonna be talking about strangulation. And why do we wanna talk about strangulation? Because strangulation is a serious form of abuse 
that can cause an acquired brain injury. Strangulation is not choking. Choking is when you have something lodged inside your mouth, your throat. Strangulation is an external attack on the neck. And some terms that you will often hear associated with strangulation are asphyxia, which is depriving the body of oxygen, which could lead to unconsciousness or death. And you have hypoxia, which is a partial loss of oxygen to the tissue, and anoxia, which is complete absence of oxygen to tissue. So when you hear these terms, all you really need to know is that it's talking about getting oxygen to cells, because in the body, cells need oxygen to live, and without it, they will be either damaged or they will die. So when we think of strangulation, it's a form of asphyxia from external pressure placed upon the neck, such that there's an obstruction of blood flow either from the brain via the jugular, from the head via the jugular vein, or to the brain via the carotid arteries, or it could be an obstruction of the airway. So if you look over here, if you have, typically we're gonna have blood that's coming out, the dirty blood is that's been used up is leaving the brain and it's gonna come out of these, the, the brain via the jugulars. If you just put a little bit of pressure on the side of the neck, you can block the jugular vein so that the blood can't leave. And then you can have increased intracranial pressure inside the brain that can potentially cause problems. If you press even more because the, the jugulars are more lateral to the carotids, then you actually press here on these arteries, oh. which are bringing oxygen rich blood into the brain. And if you push, if you press on those to the degree that now you can't, sorry, I, I'm sorry, I do apologize for my slides doing this. Um, so, so basically then you don't have that oxygen rich blood going into the brain. And what happens then? Then the brain cells don't have oxygen. So they may suffer from anoxia or hypoxia and they may be damaged or, or killed. And so strangulation doesn't just mean that your windpipe is getting collapsed and you can't breathe. That's one way of limiting oxygen to the brain, but it's very easy to strangle somebody without even leaving a mark. And so what do we know about IPV related brain injury? Okay, from my data that we know, what I know is that most IPV affected women in the United States sustain IPV related brain injury. In a sample of 99 women that I studied, I found that well, I'll just step back for a second. The 40, 42 million women that I'm representing here, that represents the number of people who, who have likely experienced sexual or physical violence in the United States. I use the United States because that's where I'm from and those are the statistics I usually use, but it may be a little bit different in Canada, but probably similar. So 42 million women may have sustained sexual or physical partner violence in the United States. I found that 99% out of 99 women, 74% sustained at least one brain injury from their partner. 74%, that would translate into over around 31 million women in the United States alone that may be walking around with a brain injury from the partner. What was even more disturbing is that 51%, just over half of the women I interviewed sustained repetitive brain injuries from their partners. So these could be two, three, or in some cases, unfortunately, too many brain injuries to count from their partners. And I know this is hard to believe, but it's true and other people have found this as well. And so in the United States alone, if we, if we would extrapolate from these data, which again is not epidemiological, epidemiologically legitimate, that would be 21 million, right? The point is here, it's, it's a huge number, but say we were to cut this in half and in half again, even if it's only 12%, that would be 5 million women walking around with repetitive brain injuries in the United States alone. This is a huge problem, far more women who are dealing with this problem than NFL football players, right? Who we have tons of data on and tons of resources for. And there's literally a handful of, for example, imaging studies on women who've experienced IPV related brain injury. So it just goes to underscore the importance of under, uh, understanding how prevalent this problem is and the lack of resources that we have towards it. What I've also found is that IPV related brain injuries in the United States are associated with poor cognitive and psychological outcomes. Having more brain injuries was associated with poor performance on tests of memory, learning, and the ability to go back and forth quickly between tasks or something we call cognitive flexibility. 
and having more brain injuries was also associated with higher ratings of general distress, depression, worry, anxiety, and traumatic stress. So it's sort of a double whammy where women are having more cognitive issues and also more psychological issues. And it was not accounted for by abuse severity, psychopathology, or substance abuse, because that was sort of like the old theory that, you know, maybe it's really not, maybe it's just, you know, women have these problems because it's horribly abusive. And I found that that was not the case. The next thing I'm gonna tell you about some brain injuries, brain connectivity studies that I, that I conducted and why we wanna talk about brain connectivity. We can measure brain connectivity in, very easily in an MRI scanner, and there's two types of brain connectivity. There's structural connectivity, which involves parts of brain cells that connect different brain regions. And then there's functional connectivity, which involves regions of the brain that are working together. Oh, yikes, I am so sorry. My slides are just wigging out on me. That are working together, but are not right next to each other. So it could be a, a brain region in the frontal part of your, your brain, and it could be a brain region in the back part of your head. And we have ways of measuring if they're working together. And basically we know that both functional and structural connectivity are really important for optimal brain function and ultimately for optimal behavior. And we know that brain injuries affect structural and functional connectivity, but we hadn't really looked at this in women. Um, and there's only been right now, there's probably one more study that we know of that, that's done this. But what did I find? Pretty simply, I found that brain injuries are associated with functional connectivity which is also associated with memory and learning. And so for the purposes of this audience, I would say it doesn't really matter what the names of these structures are, the posterior cingulate precuneus and the anterior insula. The point is, is that we can see in the brains of women who have experienced partner violence, that the more recent and the greater number of brain injuries a woman had, the less positively these two brain regions which are important regions that need to be that need to communicate with one another. It's the less positively they are communicating with one another when a woman has more brain injuries. Okay. And the less those brain regions communicate with one another, the worse women tended to be able to learn a list of words and remember that list of words 20 minutes later. So this really has meaning. And these are the types of studies that are done very frequently with other folks who are non-IPV related, on non-IPV folks. What I've also shown is that IPV-related brain injuries are associated with structural connectivity in the superior and posterior coronal radiata. And again, my slides are kind of going crazy, so I have to reverse it again. Um, but basically, again, I don't think you need to understand for the purposes, um, there's an academic lecture tomorrow where I can give more specifics, but the, the point is, is there's regions in the brain where we look at axons, that's a part of the cell, a part of the neuron, and we look at, we measure the degree of water or how the water is flowing in those axons. And we really look at that because we're trying to find potential damage related to brain injury. And that's been done a lot in football players, for example, and military folks, for example. And we use that as a sign of potential injury um, it, when, we, when we do this. And when we do that same type of study in women who have experienced partner violence, we find similar results. So basically we have neuropsychological data, we have structural imaging data, and we have functional imaging data linking the brain injuries that women sustain from their partners to these other negative outcomes. Now, if we think about strangulation, again, this is not a, a traumatic brain injury as we think of in terms of a concussion, but it is something that can damage the brain and potentially interact with a, a concussion or just the outcome of that concussion. And we show in, in a recent paper that I just published, I showed that strangulation is associated with negative outcomes. Now, if we ask, did your partner ever choke you? Well, I show that approximately, I'm sorry, 86% will report being choked by their partner. And again, choking isn't necessarily the right word, but that's a word that women will recognize. If I say, after anything your partner ever did to you, did you ever lose consciousness, feel dizzy or dazed or confused and have like an alteration in consciousness? Some people will say, yes, that happened after they were strangled, 26% in fact. And what I found was that for the women who reported these alterations in consciousness from strangulation, they had higher levels, higher levels of depression and PTSD symptoms and performed more poorly on memory tasks. And this is, this is very recent. So we also have evidence that strangulation in these women is directly related to cognitive and psychological functioning. Unfortunately, COVID has not helped the situation 
at all. Um, co in COVID, we see rates and severity of IPV has been increasing since, since COVID-19. Intimate partner violence rates have spiked globally. globally. Severity of IPV has spiked globally. And um, IPV homicides have also escalated in a number of different regions. Sadly, COVID mitigation strategies have reduced women's ability to escape and the violence or leave the situation and have effectively locked women down with their abusers at times. And for people who may think COVID is kind of over, and some people, I don't know who, but they do, we know that the, the effects of such a, a tragedy and crisis are going to last at least a year or more longer um, historically from what we've seen. So, so this is these increase in elevated rates of IPV and IPV severity and homicide are going to be with for some time. So what can we do? I want to remind people that brain injuries unseen behind closed doors, which is how they're pretty often done in, in partner violence, are likely to be misinterpreted or missed. So a brain injury behind closed doors, you may see somebody who may appear disoriented, confused, distractible, inconsistent, uncooperative, dizzy, or off balance. And if you look at that list, that looks like somebody who may be under the influence. And I think that unfortunately, that may be what happens to people, that women who have experienced partner violence may look like this and their behaviors are misinterpreted. And so they don't get the proper treatment and the proper, proper help that they need. And so basically, who do I think really needs to know this information? I would say everybody. I would say raising awareness everywhere is critical. Every person you know, because we wanna raise awareness, we wanna decrease the stigma associated with this. First responders, including police and paramedics need to know so that they're not misinterpreting the behaviors. Court personnel need to understand that women may be able to tell a coherent story, not because they're lying, but because maybe they were passed out for part of what happened, or maybe they were dragged into a different room so they can't remember how they got from one room to the next. And IPV support staff need to understand that it may be harder for women to do what you're asking them to do. Sorry again. Um, if, if, if they're recently recovering from a concussion. And finally, the women, the affected women themselves, um, this can help them understand what's going on with them. So many women have expressed relief and understanding that, oh my gosh, yeah, that was me. I didn't know why all this was going on with me, but now this makes perfect sense because I've sustained so many brain injuries. And if you're currently in the situation and maybe interfering with your ability to function, you maybe make it more difficult to go to school or hold a job financially, um, become being more financially dependent, maybe making it harder to leave the abusive partner because you can't live on your own or access necessary services like living in a shelter um, or hindering the ability to escape the abusive situation because it really does take planning and, and um, it's not easy. Also retaining custody of children for those reasons. And this slide thing is, I really apologize, this never happened to me before, but, um, and we don't know the long-term um, outcomes of IPV related TBI, but there are there is certainly evidence to suggest that there's later neurodegeneration and it may increase the likelihood for things like Alzheimer's disease or some other um, neurodegenerative disorder. Um, and also, I think it helps people to understand that there's still hope because then they can put a label on sort of a number of things that have been persisting um, with them and have been creating problems for them. So I do apologize, and I'm going to make sure this does not happen tomorrow. Um, remember, every little bit of support helps. I know this is a really down topic, and so I do like to just end with this, that um, what I've tried to do in, in my work is try basically to bring hope at the end, um, my niece created a, my niece and I created a program called Beads for Hope. And if I were there in person, I'd have a whole bunch of beads here and um, and bracelets, and they would be free to anyone who's experienced partner violence. And you could take them if you knew someone who experienced partner violence, or if you one who had anyone with a lived experience. And then also my son here, as you can see, he's giving a presentation. He had just raised, I think, like three hundred dollars um, for this cause um, because he felt like women should not be hurt. And that was him 10 giving a presentation uh, at that pink concussion meeting. Um, and so with that, I will say IPV related brain injuries are very common and dangerous. It's our job to recognize and intervene. And I do apologize for the slides. I have no idea why that happened. Um, and it was working just fine for me all day. So I do apologize. Hopefully that didn't detract too much, um, but um, thank you. <laughs> oh, we can't hear you.
You're still muted. Mute. Oh, mute. you're mute. Oh, yep. there we go. Now okay. I can hear you. Okay, good. So thank you, Eve. That was a wonderful presentation and opens our eyes to a terrible problem. Uh, some of the questions that came in, um, can you say anything about treatment of IPV and what's the prognosis for many of these people who have been damaged? Yeah, so, I mean, that's a great question. And, you know, honestly, I think the treatment is, is uh, on, on some level, it will be similar to what the treatment would be for anyone who has sustained a concussion. Now, the other thing, though, is that a lot of these women will also have things like post-traumatic stress um, and other psychopathologies, which may interact to make treatment much more difficult. And so, so I would say, ultimately, treatment is going to be similar to, so for example, if you have a, 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 a war veteran who maybe, maybe has PTSD and um, a brain injury, there could be similar components to that. Um, but the, the, in terms of treatment overall, I think the first thing is recognizing that there has been a brain injury. And I think part of the problem that's been, you know, just forever is that what sort of how women have been seen as just women who are hysterical or women who can't think straight, women who can't do X or Y or Z because they're in this abusive relationship. Or maybe, you know, why don't they just leave, which is a question that should never be asked. I couldn't really get into that here because of the time constraints. But, um, but you know, if you have a brain injury and you want to get out of a relationship that you know is, is, is dead, you know, potentially deadly without getting murdered, that takes like every cognitive capability, you know, anyone has without having brain injuries. So, so that might make it more difficult. So I would say, you know, the first step in treatment is really just honestly recognizing that there's a brain injury. And then I think using some of the same techniques. And again, I had some of this in another slide, but, but um, working with people in a way that you would work with people who have sustained a concussion, like talk slowly. No, don't talk the way I did during this, during this lecture when I was trying to get through a lot of information with a shortened time frame. Um, but um, but talk slowly and to the point, use concrete examples, repeat information and things like that. So that's just one way to intervene. Um, and then I would say treatment would involve identifying if there's you know, depression or anxiety um, co-occurring and treat the different parts, and maybe get a neuropsych assessment, find out strengths and weaknesses, et cetera. Then another question uh, for you, uh, Dr. Valera, did you only consider females in your IPV study? And that's an excellent question. I only have considered females for a couple of reasons. One, men are traditionally studied much more than women in anything in animal studies across the board, et cetera. And probably 90 or 95 percent of what we know about brain injury has been conducted with males. So I think it's really important to focus on females. The other thing is females are more are, are disproportionately likely to be injured by, by partner violence, and there is more partner violence towards women than it is towards men. There is absolutely partner violence towards men, and men are certainly injured, um, but women are disproportionately affected. And, um, and, and so, so, so those, those are some of the reasons, but I do think that it would be important to study men. Um, the other thing is, is it would be hard to study men because I think it would be very, very hard for men to actually be in, to, to enroll themselves in a study like this, because I think the stigma is even greater for men. It's not saying we shouldn't do it, but those are the, those are some of the reasons. Um, but I am opening a transgender arm of the study. So I'm trying to broaden what I'm looking at specifically. So it's not because right now I think largely what I've, what I've seen come through the doors of my study are cisgender women. And now we're sort of gearing, we've had, a, we just started a study that's really geared towards transgender women. So we can also broaden that, um, that focus a little bit more. And then one last comment from Deborah: the abuser needs to be informed of what they are doing. Education to everyone is most important. Absolutely. How do you feel about that? I agree. <laughs> I, yeah. I think... There are some, you know, there are, I mean, there's probably some, you know, there's, I mean, sadly, there are people out there who don't mind, they don't mind damaging the women. Um, there are other people who probably don't realize the damage they're doing and might not hit the woman in the head um, if, if, you know, they realize what they're doing. Um, 
but either way, I, I think there needs to be a reckoning and, you know, the, the abusers do need to realize what they're doing because it is an invisible injury in most ways. And so it seems like, well, I just hit you in the head, big deal. What's the big deal? It's not like I broke your arm. Well, it's in many cases, if you do it repeatedly, it's worse than breaking an arm. I've, I've spoken to many women whose lives are basically so changed. They can't do anything they used to do. And they used to be able, they had high power jobs and now they're, you know, on disability. Um, so it's, it's really unfortunate. Well, I think uh, that's a great answer. And thank you very much for your presentation. Eve, and I hope you'll come back again the next time we invite you. Uh, so. Thank you. Yeah, I absolutely will. Thank you so much for having me. And again, I, I super apologize for my slides. I swear they're working. I went through it a billion times today, no problems. I have no idea what happened. So I really do apologize. I hope it wasn't too distracting. We're going to ask one of our technicians to go and help <laughs> next you. time. Okay, thanks a lot.